Welcome to this video lecture on turbulent boundary layers. In the previous lecture, we talked about the Kármán momentum integral equation, and we said that we'll use that equation in order to analyze more complex boundary layers. The laminar boundary layer equations we had, uh, recall, were from an exact solution to the boundary layer equations, and it was called the Blasius solution. But there are a very limited number of uh, analytical solutions to boundary layer relations that we can actually use. So we have to rely a lot on this Kármán momentum integral equation, and we'll do that today for turbulent boundary layers. So go ahead and take a look at your screen. I have a picture here from an experiment showing uh, a turbulent boundary layer. The flow, I believe, here is from left to right. Here's the floor, kind of the base, the plate that it's flowing over. And you can see that the boundary layer is quite complex. There are these kind of um, sort of random looking structures here. It's a very challenging flow to analyze. And in fact, we can't analyze it by hand at any instant in time. It's too complex. Computationally, it would actually even be challenging to analyze as well to take into account all these vortices of different sizes. Um, but we'll be able to analyze it using the Kármán momentum integral equation plus some experimental data. Um, one of the things I want to point out in this this photograph is, you know, it's a it's obviously a complex flow field. By the way, down here it's just a reflection of what's uh, happening up above here. It's just a reflection in the plate. But you can see it's quite complex, and it's actually an unsteady flow. That if you took snapshots at different instants in time, the pictures would look different. Um, so it's an unsteady flow, but we're going to actually analyze it in a steady manner. So what that means is. Over at an instant in time, it's unsteady, but when you average the behavior over some period of time, so you know, average it over, I don't know, 10 seconds or something like that, then it starts to look more steady. You know, if I, if I averaged over a 10 second period, found kind of the average behavior there, and then I looked at another 10 second period and averaged over the behavior at that time, and I compared the two, then they would look very similar. And so it's steady. In, when you average over some period of time. And so that's what we're going to do in our analysis of this turbulent boundary layer. And, boundary layer. and in fact, that's how a lot of turbulent flows are analyzed, is over some period of time so they appear steady rather than uh, instantaneously un unsteady, which is the real case. All right, so let's go ahead and get into the material. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to use this Kármán momentum integral equation approach. and the step, first step in that approach is to actually write some expression for the velocity profile based on experimental data. And that's exactly what's done here in this very first step. Here's uh, the velo horizontal velocity profile made dimensionless by the free stream velocity or the outer flow velocity. Uh, and this expression here is found from experimental data. Now there are different expressions that people have proposed, but this is a very simple one. It's called a power law. A velocity profile because it's the dimensionless y position raised to a power. So here we have the dimension, the y position made dimensionless by the 99% boundary layer thickness. So it follows this power law behavior while it's in the boundary layer. And then outside, of course, it's just the velocity outside the boundary layer is just the outer flow velocity. And again, this just comes from some experimental data specifically for flow, turbulent flow over a flat plate with no pressure gradient. So it looks like the same kind of situation we had for our laminar boundary layers. And when I say um, turbulent flow over a flat plate, it's, it's this kind of time averaged turbulent flow. It's not an in, in, at an instant time, it's averaged over some short period of time, so it looks kind of steady. If I plot what that velocity profile looks like, it'll, it'll look like the picture over here on the right hand side. It's the red line is that 1 7th power law profile. And for comparison, the black line here is the laminar profile from that Blasius solution. So you can see they're quite different from one another. And in fact, the turbulent uh, boundary layer profile is much fuller. It's, it's closer to looking like an average. You know, an average or a uniform velocity profile would just be kind of vertical here, right? So you can see the turbulent profile is, is getting closer and closer to kind of a uniform profile. In fact, the higher the Reynolds number, the more uh, you approach that uniform velocity profile. Now the reason it's it looks fuller and, and kind of more blunt shaped here is because there's a lot of mixing that's occurring in these turbulent boundary layers. So let me just kind of sketch this out here. So here's your plate and in reality there are all these vortices that are occurring 
in the turbulent boundary layer, but those vortices mix up the fluid. So you take some high momentum fluid in the outer flow and you mix it up with the low momentum fluid next to the wall. And you know, so everything gets mixed up and mixing just makes things more homogeneous. So it gets everything closer to the average, right? That's what mixing does is it gets things more homogeneous and closer to the average. So turbulent boundary layers tend to be more um, tend to be closer to the average velocity profile. And you can see that right here. So that occurs because of mixing. The difference in these velocity profiles will actually become very important in the next lecture when we talk about pressure gradient effects and boundary layer separation. So we want to keep this picture in mind for the next lecture. Okay, so anyway, step one in the momentum integral equation approach is just to have an expression for the velocity profile based on some experimental data. So this is one expression that's very commonly used. Now, the other thing that we'll do for turbulent boundary layers is we'll rely on an experimental correlation for the shear stress, and specifically the dimensional shear stress, shear stress which we call a friction coefficient. That's given right here. So this, this expression here comes from experimental data. Now, recall that when we were dealing with laminar boundary layers and using the Kármán momentum integral equation, the expression we used for the shear stress was just tau w equals mu times du dy evaluated at y is equal to zero. We're not doing that here for the turbulent boundary layers, and the reason for that is because we're dealing with these time averaged velocity profiles. It's true that at an instant in time, the, the velocity profile in a turbulent boundary layer flow does still satisfy this equation, but that's at an instant in time. Since we're dealing with these kind of time averaged velocity profiles, it's not as, as clean as that. Um, and so we have to actually rely on some experimental data for the, for the dimensional shear stress at the wall for turbulent boundary layers. So this, is, this has been kind of like time averaged based on the velocity profile. So, so both of these things come from experimental data. And then what we do is we use them within that Kármán momentum integral equation. And I won't go through all the steps there. Um, you've presumably done that um, from the last lecture. But when all is said and done, you'll get the following expressions using that one-seventh velocity profile. Uh, one of the things that we have to do in that solution to the Kármán momentum integral equation is assume, when we're solving the differential equation that results from that, assume that the boundary layer thickness at x equals zero is zero. So it's this kind of picture here. Um, I guess I have it down, down here. We're assuming that the profile looks like that. That's our profile. But if you recall, um, if we have a uniform flow coming into our plate and uh, it starts to hit the plate, the Reynolds number will be very small at the beginning and the flow will be laminar for a period of time and then it'll tr transition to turbulence. So the, the real picture of what a, what a boundary layer might look like here is you'll, you'll have a laminar boundary layer, then it'll go through some sort of transition and then it'll become turbulent. So this part would be laminar and this part would be turbulent. So the turbulent boundary layer really should be starting at some distance from the leading edge of the plate, and that distance corresponding to a Reynolds number of about 500,000. But in our derivation that we went through in the Kármán momentum integral equation, that, that step right there assumes that the turbulent boundary layer starts directly from the leading edge. So it's, it's assuming this, that it starts off turbulent straight away. So the expressions that we have here assumes that they're, they're reasonable still um, for engineering purposes as long as our boundary layer is really long, okay? So that you can neglect the laminar part and most of it's turbulent. So, so these expressions really are limited to cases where any sort of laminar portion that you might have would be short in comparison to the turbulent portion. And again, that's, that's pretty reasonable for very long distances. If you're dealing with something short where the laminar part is actually a pretty big contribution, um, then you have to rely on some correlations, uh, which we won't talk about here. So, so don't worry about that but, um, for this course. But you just should be aware that if you're dealing with kind of shorter uh, plate lengths where the laminar portion is comparable to the turbulent portion in terms of length and such, you need to use an expression that's different than what we have here um, because 
the laminar contribution can't be neglected in that situation. So anyway, just a reminder again, these expressions are for assuming that the boundary layer is fully turbulent over the whole length. By the way, you can get a turbulent boundary layer over the whole length if you do what's called tripping up the boundary layer. If I roughened the surface right here at the, let me do this in a different color. If I roughened the surface right at the leading edge, you know, put some sort of a sandpaper there or maybe a little thin wire, you can do what's called tripping the boundary layer. And so it'll be immediately going into a turbulent boundary layer. So that's one way to get a turbulent boundary layer where this boundary condition is truly satisfied. Okay, so anyway, when we go through that Kármán momentum integral equation approach, <clears throat> excuse me, we end up with these expressions. So here is the 99% boundary layer thickness, and you can see that unlike the laminar boundary layer expressions, here we have a Reynolds number raised to the 1 7th power. Okay, and then here's one. Uh, here's the displacement thickness, here's momentum thickness, friction coefficient, and drag coefficient. So this is what we would get from this 1 7th velocity profile. Now, I, one of the things I just want to remind you is that it's based on some experimental data up here for both the velocity profile and the shear stress. These expressions are just curve fits to experimental data. Now, different people might have different curve fits. Some curve fits work better than other curve fits. Okay, so that's what motivates this next part. So here is another curve fit to that experimental friction data. You can see it's just a, let me just kind of zoom out here. You can see that this friction coefficient curve fit is different from that one. There's, they're fits to nominally the same data, but they, um, they just have different expressions because people just can fit things differently. So if you use this one, and the reason I'm showing this one is because it's what's used by Fox and McDonald, the textbook that we often use for this course. Um, if, so if you use that one and you go through the Kármán momentum integral equation, you get these expressions for the turbulent boundary layer, assuming it starts from the leading edge. These are the ones that we'll use in the course. Um, and the only reason we're doing that is because it corresponds to the textbook. It turns out these expressions are actually less accurate than the ones that I showed in the, the, the um, you know, previously. But since it's consistent with the textbook, we'll go ahead and use these. So there, there's a little more inaccuracy in these expressions. Here you'll see that the dimensionless boundary layer thickness goes as the Reynolds number raised to the one-fifth in the denominator here. So it's a different kind of power expression, ultimately, that you get. So anyway, we'll use this one, these, these equations, for the rest of the course. Now one of the other things I would like to do is just show you how the boundary layer grows for a turbulent boundary layer compared to a laminar boundary layer. Now remember for a laminar boundary layer, we had the following. So for laminar boundary layer, we had the dimensionless boundary layer, 99% boundary layer thickness, goes as 5 over the square root of the Reynolds number. Let me just go ahead and rearrange that a bit. I'll just go ahead and substitute in for the Reynolds number. And then what we'll get is delta for the laminar boundary layer. I'll put a sub L there for laminar. If you do some rearranging here, you'll see it'll be proportional to the square root of x. So uh, laminar boundary layer, will the profile will look sort of like this. this curve, delta goes is proportional to the square root of x. So that's for a laminar boundary layer. Now for a turbulent boundary layer, if we go back up here and look at this expression right here, what you'll find is that delta goes as, is proportional to x to the 4 fifths when you uh, simplify, that, simplify that down. So for a turbulent boundary layer, it'll grow, um, it'll grow faster. It'll, it'll go kind of like that where delta goes x to the 4 fifths. So a turbulent boundary layer actually grows more rapidly than a laminar boundary layer. It gets thicker faster. Okay. So uh, just to show you a comparison between these two different kinds of expressions, I, I show the, the friction coefficient as a function of Reynolds number here. Uh, this, this curve over here is for laminar flow. That's the Blasius solution. Then you go through some transition before it goes to turbulent. And then here's, here's the expressions for the turbulent case. 
There's an exact solution here that's out of the scope of our course, but we can treat that as being close to the, the real value, so it's that solid black line. The one that, the equation that um, we're using in this course is this equation 82, which is this one right here. That's the less accurate one. So you can see that it doesn't follow sort of the real behavior very well at higher Reynolds numbers. This equation 76, the one that's kind of this dot dashed line, is the one that's up here. That's, that's a little more accurate. Again, we won't concern ourselves too much with that. We'll, we'll stick with the less accurate expressions just because that's what your textbook uses. All right, and then the last thing I have here is a, um, is a table just summarizing all of the equations that we're going to use. So we have um, the expressions for our laminar boundary layer. Here, this is from the Blasia solution. And then we have our turbulent boundary layer using those you know, less accurate expressions. And remember, call that for a laminar boundary layer, we deal with the Reynolds number, that, that those are used when the Reynolds number is less than 500,000, but when the Reynolds number is greater than 500,000, we'll use the, the turbulent expressions. So this is just kind of a convenient table uh, to keep in mind when you're solving problems. All right, we'll go ahead and end it there, take a look at some of the examples I posted uh, so you can see how we use these expressions.